It's his first visit to Washington, his first visit to the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the Inter-American Development Bank, his first town hall meeting with the diaspora in Washington, and his first chat with Carib Nation. The Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable Frendel Jerome Stewart, QC, MP. Up next. I'm Darius Dean. I'm delighted today to have as my special guest the Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable Frendel Jerome Stewart, QC, MP. He's on his first visit to Washington, and after having visited the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, as well as others, he is here to talk with us about that visit and much more. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to Carib Nation. And it is my distinct pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to talk with you today. First, I'd like to recognize the fact that you came to the position of prime minister under rather inauspicious events. And you had to jump into the driver's seat, so to speak, within a very short time after taking office as deputy prime minister. How did you prepare yourself for that, and what did you have to adjust internally to take on that position? Thank you very much, Amy. It's a pleasure for me to be here to have this exchange with you. Um, I had a very long working relationship with my predecessor, David Thompson. We sat in Parliament together from 1994 when he assumed the leadership of the Democratic Labour Party. And we worked continuously between 1994 and 2008 when we went into government. Mm -hmm. In 2008, when we went into government, he appointed me Attorney General and Minister of Home Affairs and also Deputy Prime Minister. And Quite frankly, there was no significant or pronounced distance between the Prime Minister's office and that of the Attorney General, between the Prime Minister's office and that of the Deputy Prime Minister. We maintained uh, constant contact, and I was at the center of most of what he was doing. So that when he took ill, and I had to, before his death, uh, administer the affairs of the country. I was kind of prepared for it. Mm -hmm. um, and in any event, before I entered politics, I had properly prepared myself for whatever eventualities I might have had to face. So, um, although the circumstances of my assuming the office of Prime Minister were, as you said, inauspicious and um, unfortunate, I did not at any stage feel unprepared for what I was supposed mm -hmm. to do. But let's turn a little bit to the purpose for your visit, coming hot on the heels of the uh, Summit of the Americas, gave rise to assumptions that you were coming to talk to the IMF, uh, and as most people assume, when someone come from the Caribbean is coming to talk to the IMF, that they're coming to look for money, look for help, and um, I want you to have the opportunity to clarify what was the purpose of your visit and, and what was the outcome of your meeting with the IMF. My reason for coming to Washington was not to have discussions with the IMF. I was invited to Washington by the International Conservation Caucus Foundation. 
uh, to do an address at a function last night on oceans. Now, once I was coming to Washington, the embassy here decided that I couldn't just come to Washington and dart in and dart back out that as way. As has would, been the, the as precisely, practice. That they would try to put together um, a schedule of events for me. And it just happens that uh, calling on the managing director of the International Monetary Fund was one. The fact, for example, that she was not in the job 10 years ago or five years ago, but just recently, and that uh, she would have had no close relationship with Barbados mm -hmm. was a factor that was taken into account. Uh, so that was the context within which it was thought that courtesy demanded that I pay a courtesy call on her. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the president of the World Bank, uh, as I said to him, is in the departure lunch. He will soon be gone. But he was a friend of Barbados and mm -hmm. a friend of the Caribbean. And uh, it was thought that propriety demanded that I should, since I'm going to be in Washington, I should call on him and uh, just wish him well, thank him for for his interest in the Caribbean and the interest in, his interest in small island uh, states like the Caribbean. And so far as the Inter-American Development Bank is concerned, we have had a long and very fruitful relationship with that bank. We have a number of projects going with the Inter-American Development Bank, and therefore I decided to call on him as well. Mm -hmm. So it was not just the IMF, it was also the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. And um, if, I were, if, if the purpose of the visit was to come to the IMF to get assistance, uh, the meeting lasted no more than about 15 or 20 minutes. And it was not because we were chased out of the room, <laughs> but because we were just extending, yes, exchanging yes. courtesies. courtesies yeah. um, I also addressed yesterday morning the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, in the American Chamber of Commerce uh, on issues relating to the Caribbean and tried to highlight not only the challenges that we were facing, but the opportunities that were open mm -hmm. for those who wanted to invest in Barbados and the Caribbean. Uh, so so I, I did that as well. And of course, on, I would not have been forgiven, although indications are that predecessors have been. If I had come to Washington and not carved some time out to meet with the Barbadian diaspora, which I did on Sunday evening. And we certainly appreciated that. Thank you very much. Most definitely. I do want to publicly thank uh, Ambassador Beale and Ms. Simone Rudder for their efforts and um, really working very hard to facilitate this because um, it, is, it is, I know it's been a task. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Fine. Uh, let's talk a little bit then about the world economic state, the impact that has had on Barbados, and what adjustments you've had to make to maintain some normalcy in Barbados, if they can be, if that can be decided that we have been able to maintain some normalcy in Barbados. Uh, um. <laughs> It is now a truism, I think, that the world is going through its worst crisis. I say in about 100 years, when I look at the history and, and, and the, the, the spread of this crisis and the number of people it's affecting and the ways in which they've been affected, I think it's the worst crisis the world has seen in 100 years. Um, people say, since the Great Depression, I don't find any fault with that, but um, I don't think the Great Depression had the same kind of impact mm on the world as this crisis is having in terms of spread, in terms of effects, in terms of, of um, the, 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 the challenges facing uh, those affected. We've had to be very cautious in the decisions we were taking and in the, the way we spent monies earned. Now, having said that though, what the crisis did was to 
put the government in a position where, since, since the economy went into a kind of drag, the same kind of drag, of course, that the economies in the, in the, in the more developed countries uh, have been in, we've had to put mechanisms in place to ensure that that drag did not get so serious that it led to too significant a loss of jobs in the economy. We've opted for a phased approach, so therefore we put in place a medium-term fiscal strategy that would see us getting the deficit reduced over time back to comfortable levels by the year 2015 or thereabout. And to date, we are on track. It's not been easy because, of course, we've had to cut back on our expenditure. We've had, this is not a bad thing on, on the revenue side, try to get our revenues uh, boosted mm -hmm. Um, because we've had some challenges I in that tourism, regard as well. Yeah. But um, we had to make those kinds of adjustments uh, at the level of our thinking, and therefore that translated into policy. And so far we have managed uh, to keep things under control, maintain some yeah. kind of balance. You, you've done a good job, as I recall, of... Um being able to get labor, business, and government to work well together, which I think is the answer yes. to, to maintaining some stability so right. that everybody gets a, a bit of the benefit, so right, to speak. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's um, talk a little bit, but we hear a lot about some concern that the Chinese are taking over the Caribbean. Uh, what is your view? and, and what is the role of Chinese in Barbados and in the Caribbean? Barbados has had diplomatic relations with China now, I think, from about 1977. And Barbados has a very good diplomatic relationship with China. We do not regard the Chinese as sprites or as hobgoblins or people to be feared. Um, we see the Chinese as ordinary people trying to uh, find their way in the world in the same way that Barbadians are ordinary people trying to find their way in the world as well. Obviously, it's a large country, um, a powerful country. On, uh, um, it's very much, its fortunes are very much on the rise. And given the strategic geopolitical significance of of the Caribbean. Naturally, the Chinese would try to uh, leverage That's its influence right. in yeah. that region. But to assume that the Caribbean is led by blockheads who spend most of their time daydreaming and, and, and don't understand uh, uh, geopolitical designs is really to to uh, fool oneself, um, I, I think I uh, am satisfied that all of the leaders, all of my colleagues in the Caribbean understand geopolitics, understand superpower politics, understand potential superpower politics. We've seen all this already. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the Chinese know it used to be the Thank Soviet Union before. Uh, and we understand the potential for that kind of maneuvering. Mm -hmm. But we are not phased by it because Barbados made its position very clear in 1966 when we uh, acceded to independence in our first policy statement at the United Nations. We made very clear that we are friends of all and satellites of none. So we are friends of the Chinese but we will never become a Chinese satellite. <laughs> and that goes for, for everybody else. Um, the Caribbean has its own civilization, its own cultural mm -hmm. and historical ethos, and we guard that very jealously. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, our people have needs, um, and we have to attract 
investment into the region. Uh, we have to pursue developmental objectives in the region. And those countries that are well-meaning and, and want to contribute meaningfully to the development of the Caribbean, we are prepared to do business with. As long as it's on as your long, terms. Precisely. <laughs> That's the position. Right. We also hear about the relevance of CARICOM fading. As, as one of the, the leading countries in CARICOM again, what do you think is happening to CARICOM? Most people do not think it's as effective as it was intended to be. Uh, if it is not, what can be done to, to fix it, to make it relevant uh, and, and purposeful? Which doesn't seem to First be. of all, I do not share the view that CARICOM is not as effective as, as it used to be. I do not share the view that CARICOM is losing its relevance. I do not share the view that um, CARICOM is in decline. Why do we have I, that perception? I, 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 the, 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 you have a few people in the region who suffer from attention neurosis <laughs> and who believe that unless things are done in their way at their pace, something is wrong with the world. I don't get influenced by those by those types. Uh, and of course, there are some publicists in the Caribbean who, if they do not talk, their existence will sooner <laughs> or later be forgotten. I don't get carried away with that. On any objective evaluation of the Caribbean, CARICOM, we have made giant strides in that region since CORIFTA was formed in, in 1965 mm -hmm. down to the present. I think what happens is that rather than ask what has CARICOM achieved, these Jerry Myers ask what has CARICOM not achieved. Mm -hmm. And if you ask that question, it is always possible to have an answer. It's always possible to say, you haven't done that yet. Right, right. But if you ask what we have achieved, the list is so long as to be dizzying. Mm -hmm. Now, I think a lot of this has come out of the fact that at Granance in 1989, in Granance in Grenada, mm -hmm. the decision was taken to establish or to pursue the establishment of the Caribbean single market and economy as another means mm -hmm. of deepening the integration of the people of the Caribbean. Some deadlines were set. These deadlines were set before my time. And Barbados, of course, has lead responsibility for the Caribbean single market and economy because Barbados has always been a leader. Mm -hmm. uh, in the regional integration movement. Um, the deadlines have now been thought to be a little unrealistic. And unrealistic within the context of the fact that the region is going through its worst crisis or facing the worst crisis the world has seen in 100 years. And regional leaders met in, in Guyana last year and looked realistically and, and dispassionately at where we were, what we were intended to do by mm -hmm. certain deadlines, and asked the question, can we get this done? And said no. And therefore decided that we had to do a little rescheduling. Mm -hmm. That is not another way of saying that the goal of deepening the regional integration movement has been put on hold. As long ago as 1986, one of the prime movers in the regional integration movement, the then, the then Prime Minister of Barbados, Errol Barrow, mm -hmm. recently returned to office, made a speech in Georgetown in which he said, he said something which 
I think, will bear repetition here. He said that evaluations of the regional integration movement have tended to revolve around a discussion always of trade. Mm. Who will buy my pepper sauce? Mm -hmm. Who will buy my guava jelly? Who will buy my white rice salmon? Who will sugar. buy my grass and, and my rice and sugar and so on? And he said, because these things do not always work as smoothly as we would wish, we usually use difficulties in the area of trade uh -huh. to pass a blanket judgment on the regional integration movement. He dismissed that approach with contempt in, 80, in 1986. I dismiss it similarly then. now. There are so many other things happening in the Caribbean that are, are bringing our people together but and that have brought them more closely together that I do not think that because you may have a few little kinks to iron out in, 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 in areas related to trade and so on, that you can say the movement is going nowhere. Do you think, though, then, that CARICOM has not done a good enough job of keeping the people informed about what they're doing so that they don't have the opportunity to create their own perceptions? Well, you see, when you say the people, I live in Barbados, I go to other parts of the Caribbean. It is not the man, ordinary man or woman on the street in the Caribbean that raises questions about CARICOM. But do they uh, know, do they, uh, and the, my feeling is that they don't raise the question about CARICOM because they don't think about it. And it's sort of a shade that's hanging there, no, but they, nobody's they, they, paying they, they, attention. That's the same point that Barrow made in his speech in 1986 that regional integration is a lived experience for the ordinary man and woman of the Caribbean every day, every week. Mm. They move amongst the islands, they True. interface with one another, they uh, intermarry, they do all the things that, that mm -hmm. people who really belong together do. So it's, it's, it's a, like air. It's, it's a lived experience for them. They don't sit back and intellectualize like it. those who, are, who have more spare time and, and who are more leisured. And, and who always asks, what have you not done? Mm -hmm. They live the experience and they enjoy the experience. And so it's, it's like air, it's, it's a part of us. Precisely, and therefore it's precisely. Active. Okay, right. let's move to some, a couple of um, domestic affairs. Mm -hmm. For those of us outside, it seems that not only in the Caribbean, but everywhere, there's a lack of civility, there's more strife among young people, there seems to be more domestic violence. And we wonder whether this has something to do with the economic crisis putting stress on people trying to live their lives and, and the result, the domino effect is that the social issues that are coming up. In a small place like Barbados, it's magnified. And I wonder whether you see increasing crime, lack of civility among youth as something that should be, should be concerning? I, I think we tend to exaggerate these things. Um, um, I suppose it's natural, as I said, going back to Plato's days, mm -hmm. these were concerns, and they have not stopped being concerns from then until now. I think we have a, a, a collection of very creative and bold uh, and thoughtful young people in, in, in the Caribbean region. Obviously, uh, we don't live in a perfect world, and, and there, there are some segments of the young population. This has always been true at every stage of, of, of history. There are some segments of the young people who, whose approach to life might occasion us some concern. But generally speaking, I have faith in the future of the Caribbean because I think that we have a better educated and more enlightened set of young people in the Caribbean today than at any other time in Caribbean history. The expansion of educational opportunities, 
the democratic access to information has had implications, of course, for authority. The average child, because of technological developments, has greater access to more current information than his or her parents. True. But I think that also gives them access to the good and the bad. And yes, it, it does. Well, the bad whether, whether good or bad, it has implications for authority. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, ch children don't have to wait now until somebody tells them. A, a, a parent comes in and gives them information. They usually have the information before the parent does. At a, at a higher level, the more democratic access to information uh, has had, had implications for authority between people and their governments. Mm -hmm. At the same time that a housewife in Barbados, in her kitchen with a radio on, on, on the counter, hears that, that um, a congressman in the United States of America is facing charges for something. That's it. So that's the standard the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is hearing. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the times were, and it's the same time people in the university are hearing, times were when that information would get to the university first. Right. Or, and and the wait but now everybody gets the information at the same time. Everybody knew when Margaret Thatcher fell at the same time. Everybody knew when um, the man burnt himself in Tunisia that led to the, mm -hmm. the explosion of the Arab Spring. This is not privileged information anymore, and that has implications for authority. So the relationship between children and parents, between children and teachers, uh, has been changed as a result of this information revolution. I don't think there's anything that we should become too fearful about. I, I am not, um, not concerned. pessimistic about the future. <laughs> Okay, well, um, right, we right. unfortunately have run out of time, mm -hmm. and uh, I really have enjoyed talking with you. I've appreciated your time again. Mm -hmm. And uh, one last question I would have on the lighter side. What is your hobby? <laughs> I, I just like relaxing with friends and um, old talking. Uh, I... I enjoy nothing more than just sitting down and just being, having a drink and, cool. and, and just relaxing. Uh, America has a way of creating firsts and musts and, and most of things. And should I put you on the Barbados list of most distinguished elig eligible bachelor? Eligible means fit to be chosen. Mm -hmm. I think you're safe if you just say <laughs> I'm an available bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, thank you so much again. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Pleasure. Fine. Thank you. And there you have it, a conversation with the Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable Frendo Jerome Stewart, QC MP, a bird's eye view of his visit to Washington, and a little bit more about what's happening in Barbados. Thank you so much for watching us in Carib Nation. Until next time, I'm Derek Dean, and remember, our motto is, one people, one culture, one Caribbean, one nation.